Good day and welcome to the Corvo Incorporated Q2 2021 conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Douglas Delito, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corvo's fiscal 2021 second quarter earnings conference call. This call will include forward-looking statements that involve risk factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from management's current expectations. We encourage you to review the safe harbor statement contained in the earnings release published today, as well as the risk factors associated with our business and our annual report on Form 10-K filed with the SEC, because these risk factors may affect our operations and financial results. In today's release and on today's call, we provide both GAAP and non-GAAP financial results. We provide this supplemental information to enable investors to perform additional comparisons of operating results and to analyze financial performance without the impact of certain non-cash expenses or other items that may obscure trends in our underlying performance. During our call, our comments and comparisons to income statement items will be based primarily on non-GAAP results. For complete reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures, please refer to our earnings release issued earlier today available on our website at Corvo.com under Investors. Joining us today are Bob Bruggerworth, President and CEO, Mark Murphy, Chief Financial Officer, James Klein, President of Corvo's Infrastructure and Defense Products Group, and Eric Creviston, President of Corvo's Mobile Products Group, as well as other members of Corvo's management team. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Doug, and thanks to everyone for joining our call. In our second fiscal quarter, Corvo outperformed our updated guidance on revenue, gross margin, and EPS. Strength was broad-based across customers and supported by multi-year technology upgrade cycles. Both businesses had strong year-over-year growth, supported by new product launches, 5G, and Wi-Fi 6. In mobile products, the transition to 5G is fueling a shift from discrete products to higher-value content, including integrated modules in flagship and mass-market 5G smartphones. Driving growth, Corvo is leveraging our deep technology portfolio and pursuing opportunities throughout the front end, at the antenna, in the main path, in the diversity path, and across the frequency spectrum. At the antenna, the introduction of new bands and band combinations is creating significant design challenges for OEMs. Corvo solves these challenges with a range of products, including an expanding portfolio of antenna plexers. In the September quarter, we increased volume shipments of our BAW-based antenna plexer solutions to multiple Tier 1 OEM smartphone manufacturers. In the main path, Corvo's highly integrated 5G solutions include low-band, mid-high band, and ultra-high band modules. Customer design activity has been robust, and we expect our main path solutions to grow across customers as demand for integrated solutions expands throughout the high-volume mid-tier. In September, we expanded shipments of our complete main path solutions across multiple Tier 1 Android smartphone OEMs. In the diversity path, the adoption of dual transmit architectures is creating new requirements for integrated transmit and receive filtering. This is especially meaningful for Corvo because our dual connectivity modules leverage many of the technology advantages we enjoy in the main path, including high-performance ball multiplexing. We said previously we anticipate approximately 250 million 5G smartphones in calendar 20, with that number approximately doubling in 2021, and that remains our view. In ultra-wideband, we see adoption in smartphones as the catalyst for a broad ecosystem of connected devices. Similar to Bluetooth, smartphones will be the hub connecting to multiple peripherals. The technology will enhance how we interact with our media, lighting, appliances, automobiles, digital wallets, and a range of other applications in and out of the home. It will also transform how we locate equipment and production pieces on the factory floor, even how we interact with coworkers. In the September quarter, we acquired Seven Hugs Labs, a pioneer in ultra-wideband software and system solutions to enhance our capabilities in UWB solutions and accelerate adoption across mobile, 
IoT, and automotive ecosystems. The combination of our hardware technology with their software expertise positions Corvo to accelerate the development of broad ultra-wideband ecosystem, expected to reach billions of devices in the coming years. Seven Hugs brings a highly skilled team with vast experience in UWB applications and a portfolio of intellectual property. We're excited to welcome them to Corvo to build on their success and accelerate growth in ultra-wideband. We also signed a partnership with a leading design services company, Sigma Connectivity, to develop advanced UWB solutions and assist customers in the creation of breakthrough applications leveraging the unique capabilities of UWB. For wide area applications like asset tracking, Corvo enables long range, low data rate connectivity via cellular IoT. We offer a broad portfolio of discrete solutions as well as highly integrated modules for CAT-M and narrowband IoT through our partnership with Nordic Semiconductor. In Wi-Fi 6, we enjoy broad-based content gains across both businesses in support of the leading suppliers of smartphones, tablets, mesh networks, gateways, smart speakers, and virtual reality headsets. Before turning to IDP, Corvo was recently granted a license to ship certain mobile products to Huawei. Our December guidance currently contemplates no Huawei revenue as we work with the customer to understand the impact of a license. Now turning to IDP, wireless connectivity revenue more than doubled year over year. Wi-Fi revenue was broad-based across products and customers and supported by the rollout of Wi-Fi 6. Customer demand for our front-end modules and bot filters was especially strong in support of CPE and retail applications. Looking more closely at content opportunities, our shipments to the leading connected home platform provider included Wi-Fi 6 spends, bot filters, and multi-protocol SOCs. Also, for next generation Wi-Fi gateway, we were awarded the entire RF bomb in support of the leading North American multiple system operator, or MSO, including the 2.5 and 5 gigahertz FEMS and a variety of filter products. The FCC recently approved new spectrum for Wi-Fi 6E, and Corvo is actively supporting leading OEMs in the design of 6E platforms. Wi-Fi 6E will continue to increase the capacity and lower the latency of next generation platforms, creating a new class of products and applications. In defense and aerospace, Corvo was the exclusive RF recipient of the multi-year US government SHIP program, recognizing our leadership in advanced semiconductor packaging. This program will continue to advance the state of the art in packaging targeted towards a broad, broad range of applications. Also of note, we advanced the performance of defense phased radars with 150 watt, 2.9 to 3.5 gigahertz power amplifier using our industry leading GAN process. In power management, growth was driven by the transition of solid state storage in client devices such as laptops and enterprise computing and data centers. Demand has also been strong for our motor control products as brushless motor technology continues to gain share in a broad range of consumer products. Our programmable power management business is performing very well across diverse markets as we help customers enhance product performance, reduce weight, improve reliability, and bring, markets, bring products to market faster. In automotive, we began sampling a second generation automotive cellular V to X FEM that integrates the PA, LNA, switch, and BA coexistence filter to solve critical system level challenges. In wireless infrastructure, we were awarded multiple design wins in support of 5G massive MIMO deployments, expanding our customer base for GAN amplifiers. Within that, we commenced shipments of GAN amplifiers supporting massive MIMO C-band base station deployments, first in the U.S. and in other regions globally. We also launched high-performance BOF filters 
for band 41, 5G, small cells, and repeaters to help enable 5G and Wi-Fi coexistence. Next calendar year, we see, we see continued year-over-year -year growth on global 5G deployments. The deployment of 5G base stations and the upgrade to 5G smartphones are expected to span multiple years. In IDP, our 5G growth drivers include content gains in small signal devices and GAN PAs in massive MIMO and the adoption of GAN PAs in macro base station deployments. Before handing the call over to Mark, I want to thank the Corvo team for a standout performance in a tough environment. Our design teams are releasing best-in-class products. Our application engineering and sales teams are engaging closely with customers to solve their most complex RF challenges, and our global operations team continues to excel. I'm extremely proud of the team for their outstanding efforts and ongoing commitment to our customers' success. And with that, I'll hand the call over to Mark. Thanks, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. Corvo's revenue for the fiscal 21 second quarter was $1 billion, $60 million, $45 million above the midpoint of our updated guidance provided on September 8th. Following our updated guidance, customer demand continued to strengthen, and we were able to support some of that demand within the quarter. Mobile products revenue of $754 million exceeded our expectations driven by seasonal demand effects and the ramp of 5G smartphones. Infrastructure and defense products revenue of $306 million was down sequentially as expected, but up strongly year over year in support of the ongoing build out of 5G networks and the deployment of Wi-Fi 6. As a reminder, our fiscal year 2021 is a 53 week fiscal year and our September quarter was a 14-week quarter versus a typical 13-week quarter. Our last 14-week quarter occurred in the period ended October 3rd, 2015, during our fiscal 16, which was the last 53-week fiscal year reported. Non-GAAP gross margin in the second quarter was 51.7% which was above our updated guidance due to better than expected mix and favorable manufacturing cost variances. Our efforts to improve the portfolio, drive productivity, and carefully manage inventories continue to yield favorable results. Non-GAAP operating expenses in the second quarter were $219 million, higher sequentially on the additional week, incentive compensation, and other labor costs. Non-GAAP net income in the second quarter was $282 million and diluted earnings per share of $2.43 was $0.29 cents above our updated September guidance. Cash flow from operations in the September quarter was $281 million and CapEx was $44 million, yielding free cash flow of $237 million. We repurchased $105 million of shares during the quarter. During the quarter, we took steps to reduce our cost of debt and further improve our financial flexibility. We renewed our unsecured credit facility at more favorable terms and extended it to 2025. We also increased our term loan to $200 million and raised $700 million through a new issue of unsecured notes maturing in 2031. After the quarter closed, these proceeds and cash on hand were used to pay down our notes maturing in 2026. Today, our debt balance is under $1.8 billion and cash is approximately $1.1 billion. Our leverage remains low, our revolver is untapped, the weighted average maturity of our debt is 2029, and we have no material near-term maturities. With our financial flexibility, we can focus on advancing technology, supporting customers, and making prudent organic and inorganic investments that support long-term earnings and free cash flow growth. To that end, we acquired seven Hugs Labs in the second quarter 
to support the ongoing development and adoption of our ultra-wideband products and solutions. This acquisition enhances Corvo's software capabilities and is an important step in realizing the potential of UWB. We see a wide array of applications emerging with ultra-wideband technology and have significant customer engagement on the design of new products and solutions. We expect UWB to contribute meaningfully to Corvo over time. Turning to our current quarter outlook, we expect revenue of approximately $1 billion, $60 million, plus or minus $15 million. Non-GAAP gross margin of approximately 52.5%, and non-GAAP diluted earnings per share of $2.65 at the midpoint of guidance. Our December quarter revenue outlook reflects seasonal demand effects and demand for multi-year technology upgrade cycles. In mobile, demand for 5G is adding RF complexity and driving higher content, and we forecast mobile revenue in the current quarter to be approximately $790 million. We suspended shipments to Huawei in mid-September in accordance with Department of Commerce regulations, and although we've since received a license for certain mobile products, we've assumed no sales to Huawei in our current outlook. In IDP, we project revenue of approximately $270 million in the current quarter, reflecting the timing of base station deployments. We forecast IDP to sustain strong double-digit year-over-year growth through the balance of the fiscal year, with this infrastructure demand picking up in the March quarter. We expect continued strength in defense, Wi-Fi, and power management due to durable underlying trends. While considerable economic uncertainty remains with the ongoing effects of the pandemic, currently we expect end market demand to support full fiscal year double-digit revenue growth for Corvo. Our December quarter gross margin guide of approximately 52.5% reflects volume growth and ongoing efforts to improve the quality and efficiency of our business. Specifically, we've invested early and adequately in the technologies that markets need, focused our product portfolio on where we can best serve customers, gain productivity across our operations, and reduced our capital intensity. We believe our work to keep our inventories and cost structure low will help us sustain over 50% gross margin through the balance of the year, fiscal year. Non-GAAP operating expenses are projected to decrease in the December quarter to around $205 million as we return to a normal fiscal quarter length and other personnel costs decrease. We expect other expense to decrease to under $20 million on lower net interest costs. We project our current quarter and full-year non-GAAP tax rate to be at or below 8%. We still project capital expenditures to remain below $200 million in fiscal 21 and focused on areas that advance a differentiated position for Corvo to best serve customer needs, such as BA and GAN. Currently, we expect free cash flow to be approximately $900 million this fiscal year. As the September quarter results and our December quarter outlook show, Corvo continues to operate well through a challenging period while serving customers in 5G infrastructure and smartphones, Wi-Fi, IoT, defense, and other growth markets. In closing, I'd like to join Bob in thanking Corvo employees for their continued efforts during this time. Now I'll turn the call back over to the operator for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you were using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Management asks that you limit yourself to one initial question and one follow-up. 
Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll take our first question from Carl Ackerman with Cowan & Company. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, very solid results. Um, I guess for my, you know, for, for my first question, you know, I know you're having a, a record year for IDP, and it's great to see the sustained margin improvement. Uh, I know you don't provide a uh, quantitative outlook beyond one quarter, but I was hoping you, you could uh, talk about the opportunities you have in IDP next year, uh, and perhaps whether you think that segment can grow year over year. Yeah, Carl, this is James. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I think the underlying trends for the business are where we said they've been for the last several quarters. Um, uh, we've got a, a great position in 5G uh, with the rollout of massive MIMO, with the adoption of GAN, um, and the adoption of higher frequencies. I think those are all very good trends for us, and we've got a great momentum coming out of this first year of uh, deployments predominantly in China. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 uh, continues to, to roll out. We've had uh, a string of record quarters for that part of the business. And again, I expect that continue. And as Bob mentioned, uh, we see 6E coming uh, right at the end of that, uh, you know, string of results and, and really allows, allows for another opportunity to update uh, hardware. And then our defense business just continues to provide a very solid base to the business. Um, with really some of the same underlying trends that we've seen before uh, with the adoption of GAN and phased array antennas coming to play in that market. So uh, overall, I think we're positioned very well for the business to continue on this 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, trend uh, that we've been on for several years. Very helpful. Uh, and if I may, for my follow-up, you know, you have a record amount of cash on the balance sheet, and you're going to generate record-free cash flow this year. Uh, your recent capital allocation priorities have centered on, you know, IP-focused M&A. Uh, what are your thoughts on buybacks uh, and or perhaps a dividend, uh, given your robust multi-year outlook? Thank you. Carl, this is Mark. Uh, no no change in our capital allocation message. Um, you know, we, we have our cap primary uh, source of capital return has been share repurchase, which, as you can see, we did about – 44% of our free cash flow this quarter. Um, if you remember, we were we were since we were doing an updated guide, and we were also on the capital markets. We were we had periods of the quarter we, we were unable to repurchase um, outside of the 10B51. So, um, but you know we we still we still view share repurchase as our, as as our capital return uh, source. Uh, to your broader question on on you know, our, our capital returns overall, we, we've, you know, I want to point out that we reached a milestone this, this quarter and that the uh, last 12 months free cash flow margin of the business reached uh, about 25%, uh, which is, um, you know, noteworthy in, in our view. And we've generated about $860 million of free cash over the last 12 months. Uh, we've deployed about $700 million of that to acquisitions, and we've repurchased over $400 million um, uh, dollars worth of stock. So we've, we've deployed uh, $1.1 uh, billion on, on $860 million of, of free cash. And then the last six quarters, um, we, we've deployed even more. We've, we've, uh, we've generated $1.2 billion of cash. We've bought about a $1 billion worth of companies, and uh, we've repurchased about $700 million uh, worth of stock. And since inception, we've returned to shareholders 113% um, um, of our free cash flow, or $3.1 billion at an average price of $63. So, so we've had a successful um, uh, capital return plan, and uh, we continue to look at acquisitions. We've, we've done five now in the, in the past six quarters. Um, we continue to look at where it makes sense in markets, customers, technology. As you've mentioned, we've been focused on bolt-ons, uh, which we've done two bolt-ons uh, for James's business, and technology additions, which we've done three of those. Um, and um, you know, we're we're you know feeling very good about what we've done, the capital we've deployed, and have a lot of confidence going forward. Um, of the five that we've done um, over the past uh, year and a half. 
uh, that we feel very strongly they serve important and growing markets. Uh, we've been able to integrate them very quickly, and the teams are thriving within Corvo. Um, they're performing ads or better than expected. Um, and then finally, we're, um, as you can see from the seven hugs, we're investing um, in, the, in the assets we've, re we've acquired. Uh, so so uh, feeling good about both uh, deploying capital inorganically and then feel our capital return has been strong to shareholders. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question, and congratulations on the very strong results. Um, I had two as well. Um, for my first question, I, I wanted to ask on the ultra-wideband opportunity long-term. Um, Mark, I think it was you, you, you talked about um, contribution from this business potentially being meaningful over the long run. Um, just just for context, um, how big could, could this business be uh, over the next, call it two to three years, um, as a percentage of Corvo's revenue, and how are you thinking about the relative size um, uh, of, of revenue contribution between mobile, IoT, and automotive? And then I've got a quick follow-up. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Toshia. This is Eric. Uh, just to um, uh, talk about ultra-wideband and how big it, it could be, we haven't really set you know uh, public numbers for what the internal revenue for ultra-wideband might be, but as you know, there's uh, very few players in the area, and uh, the DecaWave team that we've acquired really pioneered the latest version of ultra-wideband, the impulse radio type, which is what gives it the capability of uh, proximity awareness and uh, internal uh, navigation and so forth. So we see those as being the key, you know, real um, opportunities for ultra-wideband going forward. And as, as Mark said, we think that proliferation in the mobile phone will become sort of the infrastructure or the hub for many, many applications, uh, consumer IoT, you know, smart home, of course, automotive, you, know, you will access uh, your car from your phone, uh, and even in industrial IoT applications as well, there will be opportunities there. So it's just a, a very target-rich environment, and, you know, we have said that we expect within four years, or, you know, kind of in calendar 24, it's, it's somewhere between two and four billion units. Um, again, very uh, uh, limited number of uh, people supplying that market. We think we have the broadest uh, approach to the, the uh, solution. We have a, um, a, a ability to, to not only uh, serve the mobile phone, but all the accessories that talk to the mobile phone, as well as automotive and all the industrial IoT verticals. So, um, so we're real excited about the capability and, and the, the growth prospects for the business, for sure. Toshi, as far as uh, IoT revenues, uh, they're very meaningful, but we have not broken those out. So. But it is sizable and growing very nicely. Uh, we're very pleased with that. And our automotive business today is reasonable size, but also growing very nicely and should grow substantially over the next few years. Got it. Um, thanks for that. And then, Mark, um, as my follow-up on gross margins, um, great job here. Um, and then I guess into the December quarter, you're guiding uh, margins, I think, up 80 basis points sequentially. Um, despite IDP revenue being down, which should be a headwind for, for, for mix. Um, what are some of the puts and takes um, in, in terms of gross margins in the quarter? And I guess more importantly, going forward, I think you talked about um, sustaining 50% or higher in the back half. But when you think about gross margins on a multi-year basis, um, where, where is the ceiling or what, where is the potential uh, for Corvo, given, given some of the initiatives, initiatives in place? Thank you. Yeah, so, Toshi, as it relates to um, the December quarter um, uh, gross margin, as you mentioned, we're, we're forecasting 52.5, so 80 basis points up. Uh, you're correct in that um, we've got an increased mobile mix, but, you know, there are many forms of mix, one of which is product mix. Um, so we've, we've got um, some, some, you know, favorability there. Um, about half of that um, – 80 basis points is actually uh, mix effects. Um, the um, other half is, um, you know, manufacturing costs um, uh, continue to, to be a tailwind for us um, and just uh, outstanding performance by the ops team. Uh, we've, got, we've got higher volumes, of course, which is helping us on absorption, um, but we've also had very good test yields 
um, uh, which we forecast to improve. And, and then we've had excellent spend control. And then, uh, you know, and all these things have, have uh, been contributing. And we, ex we expect that to continue to help us in the December quarter. Um, since this, since I am talking, you know, before I, I talk to a, um, you know, longer term margin trend, Toshi, I'll, I'll mention that we do expect, um, as, as you see in our business sometimes, um, we do expect gross margins to decline actually in the, in the March quarter. Uh, some of that will be mix effects. Um, we expect lower volumes in the March quarter, um, so we'll have some absorption effects and then, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, so, some other, other factors. And we, we expect gross margins to go down about 150 basis points or so um, uh, from, from the third quarter to the fourth quarter. Um, longer term, uh, we, we continue to, you know, we, we've, it's taken us a, a number of years to, to um, sort of get things aligned in the company. And, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would go back to the merger um, where, um, you know, there was a, a recognition that we needed to get the, the, techno the best in class technologies and the ability to scale them to serve what was going to be a, a multi-year technology trend, and we're here. Um, so, you know, it, it, it you know, started from efforts to um, invest in the right technologies. Um, we, we had several years of working on the right portfolio products, um, uh, and then we also had several years of getting the operations in order and, and driving productivity, right-sizing the footprint, and then being very diligent or more circumspect about capital spend, uh, which continues to, to trend down as a percent of sales, we've been able to reduce our capital intensity. So uh, a, a multidiscipline effort within the company, um, um, and, and we're going to continue to do those things. We still have room in the fab network, factory network, to uh, – to expand volume so we could still get better absorption. Paul and his team are doing a remarkable job on productivity, um, you know, driving, uh, still doing six to eight inch conversions in BA, four to six inch uh, in GAN. Uh, micro BA has been introduced and is growing as a share of our products. Um, and again, um, excellent job on cycle times, spend control, and a raft of other productivity projects. So. And then finally, we're leveraging our supply chain partners better. So when you add all those things, you know, premium technology portfolio, um, active, active product portfolio management, um, driving productivity throughout the org, and then reducing the capital intensity of the business, we think we're going to be able to sustain or expand gross margins as we go forward beyond fiscal 21. Thank you for the details, Mark. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Bill Peterson with J.P. Morgan. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking the question, and uh, nice job on the quarterly execution and, and guide. Um, I'd like to try to understand where you saw upside in September. At the time you pre-announced, you cited better smartphone demand. You call it pre-broad-based, but that even appears to have come in better expectations. I guess how broad across the, the, the six major smartphone customers you have, including Huawei, where did you see the upside there? Uh, I think you also saw a little bit of upside in IDP relative to your expectations. And I guess looking at December, compared to your prior view of sort of somewhat flattish, and now you're calling for some nice mobile growth, what's, uh, what's driving that upside uh, relative to your prior view? Is that coming from, and, you know, I guess is Android still sequentially increasing like it did in September? If you can help us understand the upside, that'd be great. Thanks, Bill. It's Bob, and uh, appreciate your questions. As far as the upside after we uh, gave uh, the guidance in early September, it was broad-based, but it was not Huawei. And uh, I've said that, I think, in a couple other uh, public forums. And it was broad-based across our other five customers that you said, the big six. Uh, Huawei was not one of them uh, during that period. We saw a little bit of upside in IDP, and as, as James pointed out, you know, our Wi-Fi business is doing extremely well, and uh, that was a little bit of that and a little bit of defense, a little bit here and there. But uh, overall, business is running extremely well. 
And, you know, our operations team did a good job of keeping up with some of that demand. So real pleased with that. Eric, did you want to take the second part of Bill's question there? Yeah, lo looking into uh, December and, and that strength, it's, it's uh, again, not Huawei, uh, <laughs> as we said. But uh, other than that, it's, it's really pretty broad-based. Uh, across, um, you know, uh, Android as well as iOS, but also uh, with an Android, um, you know, China is still continuing to, to look very strong. We're still in the very early innings of the 5G rollout, um, and there's a lot of subs there. So, um, so it, it's really fairly, fairly broad-based uh, in the current view. Yeah, thanks for that. And I guess maybe the second question for James. Um, and I think earlier you said that the 5G infrastructure should start to, you know, improve after December. But I guess for the composite of the business, assuming you have better visibility across areas like defense and, and longer-term opportunities, how should we think about the season, seasonality of that business? Uh, you know, should we assume Wi-Fi still sustains uh, into the first half of next year based off work from home trends and other factors? Just trying to get a feel for how you see that business trending here in the next couple quarters. Yeah, thanks for the question, Bill. Um, you know, as Mark said last quarter, and I think we're tracking pretty close to that, um, you'll see us, uh, you know, Q3, we've already said 270. Um, I think Q4 will you'll be very similar to the mark to the range that Mark talked about last quarter. And then we'll see that growth start back in, uh, in Q1 of next physical year. Um, and as I said before, I, I think the underlying markets really support our ability to grow at, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent and, you know, perhaps somewhere in the high range of that we'll see. We, we had an absolutely great first half. If you look at our first half of this year compared to the same period last year, we grew 55%. And uh, the year-over-year -year growth rate for the, the quarter we're guiding now is about 30%. So we've, we've got some very, very nice trends growing up, going on in the business. We've got great technology, um, really, really strong partnerships with our customers. So, you know, I, I, I think we're going we're gonna, to, you know, go through some lumpiness with the deployment of 5G. And then it's going to pick right back up as we go into uh, into our fourth quarter and into the first part of uh, of our FY22. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Uh, thanks for taking my questions and uh, congratulations on, on the strong results. Um, first question: um, I'm curious, what your sense is of the sell through? of uh, 5G smartphones across your customer base and, you know, what, what that says about seasonality for the March quarter. You know, a part of me says that, look, we are in the early stages of 5G, that and, you know, March, the 5G strength and content gains can continue. So that would argue for perhaps a more measured seasonality going into March, you know, down 8 9%. Uh, but then you had such a strong uh, second half uh, that maybe it could be more traditional um, seasonality down, you know, something in the, in the mid-teens. I'm just curious, what side are you leaning uh, towards? And just conceptually, what, what is your sense of sell-through in, in 5G smartphones? Yeah, Vivek, it's it's Mark. Um, you know, we're we're not going to give uh, you know detailed uh, guidance on March, but maybe make a couple of comments here. Um, I, I think the most important thing is that we believe the technology upgrade cycle for 5G is is multi-year in both handsets and infrastructure. So, and and that applies to broader con connectivity uh, trends as well, which we think are durable. So, but but there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, still on the broader market, um, it, you know, on, on the rate and pace of the rollout, um, and, and maybe in the immediate term, and then, and then of course we've got the associated effects of, of the pandemic, the global economic recovery, um, and, and other factors. Um, you know, uh, I would add that um, you know the the, the, the pickup on 5G and work from home. Um, uh, and other demand factors are actually straining parts of the of, of the supply chain. And as you said, we we do need to you know we need to watch sell through. I mean, fortunately for us, our inventories are 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 good, and and our um, um, and we've also got uh, the supply chain inventories are lean, um, uh, and we're focused on doing everything we can to meet meet customer needs. Um, but to, to your you know, directly to your question for March, we, we think it's reasonable to assume 
uh, some sort of decline over what's a very, very strong December. Um, you know, uh, we would say 10% or more sequential decline would is a view uh, we, we have currently um, for our guide. And then, uh, and then we would expect, uh, as I mentioned, Vivek, gross margin to decline sequentially 150 basis points or more um, on, on lower volumes, uh, some mix effects and, and other factors. Uh, we would still be up on gross margin year over year, 100 basis points or more. Um, and then we would expect OPEX to be uh, flat to up as, as we continue to invest for the long term. But, but I would leave it with, um, you know, we, again, we, we view this as a multi-year um, uh, you know, secular trend and, and um, are investing appropriately. Got it. Very helpful, Mark. And then for my follow-up, um, what do you think about the competition from Qualcomm? You know, they spoke about a 50, 60 percent, you know, plus kind of growth rate in their um, RF front-end um, business. Is that apples to apples to what you sell? You know, are, are you starting to see them in more places? Do, do they have some kind of advantage because they're able to bundle some of their RF components uh, with the 5G uh, modem and, and the strong position they have on the 5G uh, modem? I'm just curious, uh, has the competitive landscape uh, changed uh, for you uh, from a Qualcomm perspective um, from, from what you're seeing right now? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Vivek. I, I don't think there's really been any, any change. Um, we've talked a bit about this before. I think different companies uh, view the RF TAM differently or what they, they choose to put in, in into their RF business. And uh, in, in the case of Qualcomm, they got a lot of other uh, features and functionalities uh, uh, that they include that uh, that aren't addressed by the RF uh, uh, community generally. So, you know, power management pieces, I think they're uh, probably benefiting quite well from the initial rollout of millimeter wave uh, in that they're, uh, we believe, at least including a great deal of functionality and content that is, that is not RF uh, at all by, by nature. Um, so it's just a question of what they put into what, what they call RF, I think, more than anything else. Um, in terms of you know, their attach rate and true RF components onto their baseband. Uh, we haven't seen any, any real change in that dynamic there where, um, you know, our customers are looking for best in class RF components and, uh, and uh, the vast majority of, of the actual RF content is, is not uh, generally addressable by them, uh, competitively at least in, in, in the mass market. So there's uh, a lot of opportunity and uh, we haven't really seen the, the dynamic change. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Harsh Kumar with Piper Sandler. Yeah, hey guys. First of all, you know, solid congratulations on uh, tremendous performance. Um, so I'll pick it up right where the, the previous question was. So with respect to millimeter wave, my understanding is the traditional sub six players in the RF are not there yet, including yourself. So that remained an opportunity. Um, do you think it's a matter of coverage? It's a matter of time before you're able to play in there, or is just there's just not you know not a use for your technology over there, or is it some other industry dislocation type thing where the baseband change happened and you 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 have a shot to get in? And just some color would be appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Harsh. Uh, this is Eric again. Um, you know, when when we look at uh, at millimeter wave, I think it's important to realize. I mean, Corvo is, is certainly a technology leader in millimeter wave. The, the work that James and his group have been doing for decades uh, to provide millimeter wave in, in uh, incredibly high performance uh, situations is second to none, and our customers have validated that. If we if we go up and do you know component level evaluations of, of various functions in the millimeter wave front end, uh, there's no question there'd be a, a huge advantage to the system at at going uh, with with our technology. So the question is really uh, the rate and pace of the rollout and, and then seeing how the economics play out. I think. As of now, uh, we're sort of testing the waters in millimeter wave. So customers are employing sort of easy to use integrated solutions. Uh, may not have the best performance, but for now, the real question is whether there's any infrastructure to talk to. Um, there's, there's rollouts, of course, across dozens of cities, but they're incredibly limited in terms of coverage area and real world dynamics of, of uh, getting the signal in and out in any reasonable way. Um, and the cost of employing the infrastructure and being able to, you know, be mobile with any device on a, on a millimeter wave, 
network. There's just a lot of questions there that haven't been sorted out. So I think it's great that it's being tested as an RF company. We would be thrilled if it becomes mainstream uh, and uh, we'd love to participate in it. I think customers uh, have all evaluated our technology. It's, it's really a matter of waiting to see if the, uh, the need really uh, survives the first one or two generations. Understood. Thanks, Eric. And then for my follow-up, um, do you see RF content increasing again next year associated with 5G um, after this initial wave of 5G content uptake? And if so, like, what would be some of the big broad drivers? Is it just the same as, you know, expanded bands, expanded channels, and things of that nature, or do you see something else happening? Yes, we let's see. There's probably two ways to think about it. So, you know, we said the the units for 5G we expect to roughly double again next year, so from 250 to 500. But uh, on that doubling, uh, the content increase staying at roughly the same at five to seven dollars, depending upon the tier and you know the exact model, right? So, uh, in that sense, you're seeing you know the units times the same uh, same. But then longer term, I think you're going to see the same dynamic that's driven 4G. So we're still very early in the 5G cycle. Uh, there are new bands still coming, and within the bands, they're you know trying to find ways to use more of the spectrum. And so, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a priority on higher technology to, to monetize all that spectrum and, and get the data out of it that 5G promises. Um, we're also just beginning to see, you know, these uh, dual connect modules where uh, we've got dual transmit antennas now uh, for 5G. And some of these are really challenging, uh, you know, frequency uh, allocations and, and the bands that they want to transmit on uh, simultaneously. That's going to add an awful lot of complexity and challenge for RF, which will, will drive even more value there, I think. And so, you know, we're investing in the areas that we think are going to be our customers' toughest uh, challenges. So as the RF uh, gets harder and, and, and more complex and more valuable, we're going to be positioned to provide the best technology to solve the problem. Thanks, guys. Congratulations. Thanks, Lars. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Gary Mobley with Wells Fargo Securities. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. I want to ask about the different moving pieces in the China smartphone market. You mentioned you have a, perhaps a limited license with Huawei tied specifically to their handset business. I think some others have commented that they as well have received a limited license from the U.S. Commerce Department. And so uh, I'm curious if they have uh, their supply chain sort of shored up to feed into their mobile handset business, or do you – I'd like to hear your opinion on whether or not, you know, they perhaps could lose share and how Corvo could benefit as your uh, market share at alternative customers, customers may be higher. Uh, any thoughts there? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Uh, number one, as you pointed out, our, our license – is for certain mobile products, not IDP. So you're correct. Let's get that clean. And, you know, we're working with the customer, but I think we pointed out on our last quarter call that, you know, we're very fortunate that we have the same products that we sell to all these customers, and they go with multiple baseband. So from a supply perspective, you know, we're very fortunate with our inventories that, you know, we sell the same components to all these guys. And the mobile team's done a fantastic job of, you know, designing products that will work across customers and across baselines. Okay. As my follow-up, I wanted to ask about Huawei again, but on the, on the GAN hemp power amplifier side, I believe they've been pretty much the driving force of, of that portion of your business as a lead customer in, in China. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the adoption of some, you know, non-Huawei, you know, 5G RF players. Yeah, well, we haven't shipped uh, GAN to Huawei for quite a long time, well over a year, <laughs> over a year. So we've been seeing, you know, tremendous growth in our GAN business, as James loves to talk about, and I'll let him go through that to multiple customers, as I said in my uh, opening remarks. But I, I can tell James would love to answer this. So, James, go ahead. Show is yours. Yeah, I mean, ad adoption has really been uh, broad-based, Gary. So we, we see pretty pretty much all of the OEMs, and I guess I can say all of the OEMs have programs related to GAN. Uh, multiple of those OEMs have those products into production, um, and, and typically in a massive MIMO uh, uh, construct, so, you know, relatively high content in all of those. Um, we, we've got wins across, uh, again, multiple of those OEMs that are supporting both deployments in China and in other parts of the world. So I think, I think adoption is going very, very good. 
we had a great GAN quarter. We, we tied a record from the quarter before. And uh, we've almost quadrupled our GAN business uh, from period uh, the same period last year. So I, I think those trends are, are just like we have projected, that 5G is really going to drive MIMO and higher frequencies, and that's going to drive the adoption of GAN. Um, we're very focused on scaling the technology and continuing to improve the performance uh, and uh, you know, so that we can continue this ramp as we go because we very much are – in the early innings of uh, 5G deployments around the world. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Craig Hedenbach with Morgan Stanley. Yes, thank you. I had a question on, on the gross margin and, and really from a mixed perspective within mobile. Any context you could share in terms of perhaps some of the tailwinds that integration is, is helping as well as maybe, you know, the Bob business increasing as, as a percent of total as, as you go out in time? Yeah, Craig, we, we typically don't break out, out, you know, mix in detail, but but you're correct. I mean, what's, what's helping us is this ongoing trend of integration and particularly uh, BAW-related modules. Um, as, as you know, uh, our largest fab is Richardson's, the largest cost structure um, so volumes and continued growth in BAW is, is important, and that's that's helping. Um, you know, and there there are other products where we're you know have highly specialized technology uh, that that uh, that is helpful in the mix as well. But but certainly BAW and uh, you know both BAW and other integrated modules is is a part of the favorable mix. Got it. Thanks. And then just a follow up for Eric. You know, in, in terms of integration within mid-range phones or, or mass market, can you talk about perhaps kind of wh where we are in that cycle, if you will, in terms of that's that's been an important growth driver, but just how much more do you see that in terms of the market moves towards integration and, and how much does 5G also play a, a role in terms of the need versus discrete parts? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. As you, as you know, 4G sort of uh, grew up discrete, and as it became more complicated and more bands, the you know, integration became uh, uh, required really to, to fit everything into the space. And 5G is essentially launched with fully integrated modules. And uh, to date, uh, I don't believe we're aware of any uh, any design that's going discrete. Um, uh, it's just very, very, very complex. And once you're used to having a highly integrated um, fairly miniaturized, compact RF solution. It's really hard to undo that and go to go to discrete solutions because you still have to do all of this uh, multi-band uh, operation and, and multiplexing and so forth. So it's very hard for a, a phone customer to match these things uh, on the phone board. So um, if not 100%, the vast majority uh, uh, of, uh, of 5G phones are, are continuing to use fully integrated solutions. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Edward Snyder with Charty, Charter Equity Research. Thanks a lot. Um, if I could, Eric, you know, between Bob's comments and the details from our own teardowns, uh, it seems as if most of the strength you're seeing uh, in your business is from main path modules in phones and probably tuners, which both have been very good. But, uh, you know, Skyworks is doing very well in diversity, even with the new transmit versions, and there's been a huge increase in antenna plexers at Apple. Um, which seem to all have gone to Broadcom. I know you've got the technology to play in all these areas, uh, but we really haven't seen a lot of it just yet. Will we see more participation from Corvo in these areas as these technologies move into the Chinese phones? Or do you think, you know, because you've only really shifted in the last year or so to focus more on you know, all these other, you know, I would say lucrative but lower ASP stuff than the big mid-high band, is it just a matter of time that you think you might make inroads into the, into the non-Chinese OEMs? And then Mark, if yeah. you could, go ahead, so please. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, since we formed Corvo, we, we really had a focus on, on looking at the full architecture because we've got visibility into it and uh, investing in the, the key technologies that are going to solve the customer's toughest problems. And you're right, we've got tremendous expertise around, around the antenna systems, uh, not just tuning, but also um, multiplexing and antenna plexing. Um, and switching in LNAs and all the things you need to make the antenna networks work. And you know that's getting to be more and more and more important, regardless of the tier or the, or the customer base, right? Uh, but also the advanced power management uh, that we have, which is very specialized power management to help 
uh, in these high modulation uh, uh, standards. We're going to continue to invest in that. We think there's new opportunities there. Um, our ball filtering, uh, we believe we're second to none now, uh, and we're not slowing down. We've got many, many more improvements and, and, uh, and uh, steps up in, in performance and cost as well, uh, reduction for, for ball. So, you know, that's going to be the anchor of a whole suite of modules, as you're, as you're indicating. Um, and, uh, you know, even the receive modules that have transmit uh, capability in them, and then all of the, uh, the main path modules will continue to, to rely heavily uh, on BAW. So, you know, I don't think we're limited uh, at all at where we play. We're, it's a target-rich environment for us. We're, you know, kind of prioritizing our investments to where we think we'll get the best ROI. I think it's going really well. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to build, build out the portfolio and continue to play in more and more areas as we see them uh, being attractive. Great. Thank you. And then, Mark, if I could, and I had a short one for James, too. But, Mark, last time Corvo hit 51 and a half ish gross margin was June of 15, and revenue was about $670 million. Uh, it's about 60% higher last quarter, uh, and unlike at 15, uh, you're now shipping a lot more GAN, BAW, and tuners, all of which carry very good gross margins. Is the difference in revenue to gross margin something structural in the FAB, or is it more of a reflection of Corbo capturing all those filters and passive devices uh, that used to be displayed by the discrete component vendors that are now being rolled into your big modules? Because obviously it increases your ASP, but maybe dilutes margin a bit more. And I know that was the, the vision when Corbo was formed, that you guys could start capturing a lot of this other discrete content. Yeah, Ed, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Your 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 figures were correct in the historical data, but um, we we we've invested a lot in the business since then. And as you know, the you know there were there were efforts to um, you know rationalize the footprint, make make it make it suited to how we want to take the business forward. And as Eric just said, um, a lot around active portfolio management. We're at a point now where we've steadily increased. Um, uh, gross margins uh, from a low uh, September 16, and uh, we feel good about, uh, well, we feel great about the technology in the business. Um, as Eric, you know, talked through, we're making the right product decisions that are best for our customers and for us. Um, the operations team is performing very well, and there's a lot of runway on productivity, and, and we'll continue to uh, that'll continue to hopefully be tailwind on margins. There should be, and then and then we've got uh, we're reducing our capital intensity, um, and uh, and all that you know points to um, you know we should be able to sustain these levels and and over time don't see why we shouldn't be able to expand margins. Thank you. This concludes today's question and answer session. I'll now turn it back to management for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us on our call tonight. We'll be presenting via webcast at upcoming investor conferences, and we invite everyone to listen in. Thanks again, and have a great night. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>